We're on, and this is this year, page 115. We're halfway through. Alanisim for Hanukkah. Uh, that's better. I can see. Um, so what we had so far, introduction was, we're giving general thanks for the miracles and the battles in particular that were fought. And we have that it's the time of Matisio and his children. <coughs> we said it was, a civil, it was a civil war motivated by the Greek, the Greeks and their Greek culture. And we talked about the fact that they believe in nature, and that's why they, at a certain point, opposed Shabbos, Mila, and uh, Rosh Chodesh, because Rosh Chodesh, you can overpower the moon. And then it says that you stood for them in their time of their pain. Oh. So I forgot to turn this on. Oh. Shalom Rabbi Yosef. Hodu Lashem Kito. Mashalcha. Okay. Okay. I need Kito. Tadara Balacha. Someone who does me a favor, so. Okay. So, um, uh, that he stood for us and, and fought our battle and that took the revenge from us, and he handed over the mighty into the hands of the weak and the many into the hands of the few. And we pointed out that in revolutionary wars, fighting for your homeland against foreign mercenaries, that that's something which, uh, even though it was a civil war, that's something where the, the, the smaller army can can um, can be victorious over the larger army, and those who are spiritually depraved into the hands of the tzaddikim, that's definitely something which the Baruch Hu engineers. But it could be engineered, like the Maharal says, in a way that it doesn't. Uh, you don't have many open miracles in the battle. And then it says, and for you. In other words, you, Akadosh Baruch Hu, for yourself, you made a great and holy name in your world. In other words, the people who witness the victory are going to associate it with you and your great name, the great and holy name. And for your people, Israel, you made a great salvation. And, and they translate Purkin in a funny way. Victory like this day. So now, I think what we have to understand here is that we, we represent the Kodesh Baruch in the world. And because we do, what happens to us reflects on the Kodesh Baruch Hu. I'll give you a sample of the idea when Akash Baruch Hu tells Avraham that he, Akash Baruch Hu, is going to destroy the city of stone. So Avraham argues on behalf of stone. And it's a very complex argument. Complex and subtle argument. And what he says, he makes two points. In the first, it's three verses long. The first and last verse say, you can't kill the righteous. You cannot do that. The judge of the whole world, earth won't do justice. It means your anger going to wipe away the righteous as well as the, as well, as the, as the evil, the wicked. Can't do that. In the middle, he makes an entirely different claim. In the middle, he says, if there'll be 50 righteous people in the city, please don't kill the wicked. That's an entirely different idea. That's mercy for the wicked. The first the third verse is only saying, don't kill the righteous. When you're killing the wicked, don't kill the righteous also. But the first and third verses give up on the wicked. They're wicked, they deserve to die. The middle one says, have mercy even on the wicked. Now, 
We look at the Taina that, that's expressed in the first and third verse. The judge of all the earth can't, uh, uh, how, uh, can't do injustice. And he puts it in very strong terms. Abraham does. So the first thought is, right. I mean, God can't be unjust. Maybe mercy, maybe they don't deserve mercy. Not everybody deserves mercy. Sometimes justice has to be carried out. But to kill the righteous also? That's the first thought. The second thought is, well, if that's so obvious and that's so impossible to accept, why does Abraham have to ask for it? Why doesn't Abraham just take it for granted? Abraham should have said, of course you're not going to kill the righteous together with the wicked. That's, that's you say in Yiddish, upgrad. That's, that's for, for sure what they take it for granted. But I want you to also have mercy on the wicked. Why does he make such a strong claim that you can't do that? And I didn't see anybody ask the question. I think it's a good question, and I have an answer for it, but it's only my answer, so you, know, you could look elsewhere. Let's ask about this world. Do righteous people suffer in this world? Oh, yes, they do. It happens all the time. And the Torah sources recognize it. The book of Job was written by who? The author of the book of Job? Moses. Hello, it's a very old book. Jews have been reading it for 3,300 years. The idea of righteous people suffering is definitely part of our literature. It's definitely part of our tradition. And anybody who has his eyes open sees it happen in the world. And the Gemara talks about it. Righteous people do suffer. So now let's come back to Abraham and ask the question the third time, back around the corner and say, so why are you so indignant that it can't happen? It does happen. It happens very often. The judge of all the world shall not do justice. So righteous people suffer often. Certainly October 7th, but even beyond that. So I think the answer is this. It depends upon how they suffer, what makes them suffer. If they suffer through natural forces or through the evil that people do, you're not going to infer the values and priorities of the Creator because nature is designed to hide the Creator. We spoke about that. When, when the world operates according to what looks like nature, what looks like it operates on its own blindly, that's because the Kodesh Baruch Hu wants there to be something that hides his presence. That's part of the essential character of this world. I told you the word olam comes from a root that, that means to hide. So the word for world means the world hides the Kodesh Baruch Hu. So there, no one's going to judge your values and your priorities and your principles on the basis of what happens through the, for what looks like natural uh, events or through the evil that people do because Kodesh Baruch Hu gave us free will. But you, says Abraham to Kodesh Baruch Hu about Stom, you are proposing to do this with an open, visible, spectacular miracle. From this people are going to read what you are like. They are going to infer your principles. Here you can't do it. Here you can't kill the righteous together with the wicked because people are going to say, aha, so that's who he is. That's who he is. Here he's showing himself to us. He's not hiding. No, so from it we should be able to read his principles. That, I think, is what's going on behind, <coughs> behind um, Avram's uh, plea. And I, I think that uh, this is behind what Moses says to God after the Gog Calf, after the sin of the spies, when God says to Moses, I'm ready, ready to wipe them out, Moses says, you can't do that. And, oh, I should put this in the And there, one of his claims is, the non-Jews will look at what you did, and they'll say, he hates this people, or he didn't, wasn't strong enough to conquer the 31 kings of, of, of Canaan. They'll read into it about you, what your character is, what your principles are, what your capabilities are, because you're going to do it with an open miracle. So again, my Yom Hagoyim, what will the Goyim say? Which often, I, I, in, in normal moral discourse, you don't decide what's morally right and wrong because of what people will say. But here, if people are going to misunderstand who a Kodesh Baruch Hu is, what his principles are, what his character is, 
Kodesh Baruch Hu has a goal of reaching all mankind, not just Jews. So, that being the case, since we represent him in the world, what happens to us is something which they are going to read into. Now, there, in the case of, of what Moses confronted Kodesh Baruch Hu about, is something that he was pr proposing to do with an open miracle. But even without an open miracle, non-Jews who, who have an understanding of how the world works expect Jews to be protected because they're the chosen people. Um, so, that being the case, when we are downtrodden and we are victimized by the Greeks, so then it's a desecration of God's name. This is brought in, in all this far. So now that you engineered this uh, great battle for us, this great salvation, this great victory, you made uh, a holy and great name for yourself in the world, and for the Jewish people, you made a salvation. Now, of course, if you're talking about cause and effect, it's backwards. By making a great salvation for us, you made for yourself a, a great name in the world. But the more important effect is making his name great. That's, that's, the, that's the key thing that, that wants to be done. Indeed, when we ask for salvation and protection, we say, Laman Shimcha, for the sake of your name. We're not asking for ourselves. We're thinking of the sake of the fact that when we are downtrodden, your name is desecrated. And when you save us, then your name will be glorified. So really the most important thing is that his name should be glorified. I think that's one of the, one of the things that's being communicated here is that by making the salvation for us, you, because we represent you in the world, <coughs> you made for yourself a, a, a great and holy name in the world. Very good, absolutely. And this is a general theme. You say that the two agendas that have to be balanced. This happens all the time. This is a crucial, crucial idea in understanding how Kaj Baruch runs the world. Not what he is, but how he runs the world. For example, you have Chesed and Din. Chesed loving kindness. And Din is strict justice. And as I have told you, in a particular instance, they contradict one another. A particular instance cannot be both Chesed and Din. Chesed means... Din means you get what you deserve, what you've earned, what's yours by right. And chesed means you get something you didn't earn and you don't deserve. And it's not yours by right. So it can't be both. That's a contradiction. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the Kodesh Baruch Hu chooses chesed, sometimes he chooses din, because there is a contradiction in the way in which they would operate. And I think that's, so, that's true for the two that you're choosing now as well. Oh. Oh, that, that hiding on the one hand, which is part of his, part of his principle, and... Uh, showing correct principles is also something. Let me just, I've got to calibrate this. I keep forgetting this comes up now. It's about 170. So let's do 170. Wouldn't it be unfair for him to create any pain in the world while he's trying to hide himself? I don't know, but pain is how he hides himself. Pain is how he hides himself. Why should people experience pain? Because Hashem wants to hide himself. Because the hiding gives them the opportunity to do what's the best thing for themselves, and that is to exercise free will. If you're not going to be hidden, that would mean reward and punishment would be immediate upon the action. When you do that, you take away all moral incentive, you just become, just become selfish, and uh, there's no test of free will. I mean, I'm taking it in two words. There's a little, whole literature on that, but that's the, that's the bottom line. Oh, yeah. So if, if, the, if the goal is to glorify the name of Hashem, uh, as, as like the, 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 the real um, thing that is at stake here, so, I mean, I don't know if it's being read in between the lines, but is it uh, that when the Jews are not going to glorify to to it to the, pro so to speak, the proper way, then... There is like a greater um, uh, like a danger, and for for the Jews, even so that it, that affects the sake of Hashem, the, like the, the the name of Hashem. But that's right. That, that's what he's pointing out. Yeah. All right, so it's the same tension that he was pointing out. 
In other words, here where he, where he decides to punish us, right? So then um, the, the punishment is then going to degrade his name in the world. And uh, that's what, similar to what we say, Imo and Chiva Tzara, uh, that when we are in pain and suffering, he's also suffering. And that includes going into Golas. That the Shechina goes into Golas with us. The Shechina goes into Golas. That's a horrible thing, a horrible idea. Yeah, that's what happens. So he has to balance the tragedy of the Shechina going into Golas versus what happens when we're not punished, depending upon the way in which we're behaving. It's like they say, the base of Mikdash. He destroyed the base of Mikdash because we weren't, we weren't uh, behaving appropriately. But he's destroying his, his temple, his base of Mikdash. How does that work? The answer is the base of Mikdash is a, is a tool, a very powerful tool, to affect how the world runs. And if we're not using, about living the right way, we're going to do great destruction with that tool. So it's to save the world from that destruction and to save us from being guilty for that destruction takes away the, takes away the base of Mikdash. All right, it's all, all linked. All of it's linked. It's a linked idea. Okay, now. Very careful here. Um, <clears throat> after that, your children came into the holy house, the temple, and cleaned up, they, they removed all of the, I mean, battles were fought there. They removed all of the junk from, the, from your, your, your heichal chamber, and they purified the base of Mikdash, and they lit Neros in the courtyards uh, of your holy place. <coughs> and they established eight days of Hanukkah, these eight days of Hanukkah, to give thanks and to praise your great name. Okay. Now, we have the whole long story, right? Does it occur to you that something's missing here? The war. Sorry? The war? We started off with battles in the middle of battles and the, had the many into the hands of the few with the, the whole few, right? The, the battle is getting a lot of, a lot of publicity here. Sorry, the candles. Yeah, the menorah, lighting the menorah, eight days of miracle oil and all the rest. It's totally missing. It's totally missing. Mara points this out. It, it, when I, I mean, when I read it, I thought to myself, boy, am I a dope. And it never occurred to me. Am I asleep all the time? I'm just not paying attention. This is what we say in prayer, and this is what we say in benching, we break grace after the meals, right? This is what we say. So, that it's not here is a shock. But all right, you'll say, okay, maybe for prayer and maybe for benching, maybe there's some reason, some explanation for why we, we don't mention the the miracle of the of the of the of the of the oil. But surely, surely, when we're standing in front of the menorah and we're going to light the menorah, and there's a little paragraph in the Siddur, a little paragraph in the Siddur to say, before we light the menorah, surely there you'll say something about the miracle of the oil, right? I mean that's where you have to say, because that's why you're lighting the menorah to celebrate the miracle of the oil. Well let's take a look. Let's take a look at where it's talking uh, page itself. Let's see. What page is Hanukkah on? Here we are. Uh, hmm. Okay, 782. Page 782. Here we go. 782. No. It says 792. Probably can't see. Okay. Here we go. These lights that we are kindling for the miracles and wonders and salvations 
and wars that you did for our ancestors in those days at this time through your holy priests and all eight days of Hanukkah these lights are holy and we have no permission to make, make use of them just to see them in order to give thanks and praise to your great name for your miracles and your wonders and your salvation. Period. Not even a hint about the, the miracle of the oil. That's astonishing. That's really astonishing. Ask other people. Ask people when you go to the houses and everything else. Ask them, why is the oil missing from the liturgy entirely, even when you're going to light the menorah? So the Maharal has a very deep explanation of this. He says, I'm just, I mean, it could take a week to talk about it, I'm just skimming off the top. He says, as I told you before, that if you were attached to the Maccabean forces, you would not have seen any open miracles. And the only open miracle was the miracle of the oil. What's the lesson of Hanukkah? What is it supposed to teach us? So I told you that the Greeks believe in nature. Nature is everything. Even the gods are features of nature. The world is eternal, no beginning and no end. The laws of nature are absolutely necessary. Everything is nature. What's our attitude? Our attitude is nothing is nature. Nature is nothing. It's zero. It's all divine activity. And for those who are prejudiced and haven't thought about it in any depth, the Rambam agrees to this. Don't tell me that he believes in nature and laws of nature and, and the natural world and so forth and so on. I, I'm not going to go through the... the I'm, I'm writing a book on the subject at the moment. Um, Surah the Rabban, who talks about hidden miracles and visible miracles, it says anyone who believes that anything that happens to any human being is, is uh, nature alone, has no part in, Torah, in Moses' Torah. No part in Moses' Torah. <clears throat> and for the aficionados, he never it says that about the Rambam. And his commentary in the book of Job, he mentions the Rambam's position and doesn't criticize it. So don't tell me there's a big bachloik between the philosopher and the Kabbalist and so forth and so on. That's nonsense. So how do you communicate that nature is nothing? Meaning, that nature is, as we've said now six times, just how Kodesh Baruch Hu hides his presence. When you hide something that's present, it's present, hello, it didn't go off to the galaxies where it's invisible. Something that's hiding is right in front of you on the table, you just don't see it. Like, how do you, die, how, how do you hide a diamond? Well, you could dig a hole in the backyard, or you could put a few trinkets on the table in a, in a casual dish, you know, some money and some stones and some... Other things, they put the diamond in there, no one will even notice it. It's right there on your table, but no one will notice it. No one will assume that that's where you're going to put a precious diamond. Things that are, are present can be hidden. When you talk about hiding something, typically it is present. You just put it out of sight where no one can see it. So the point of the, of the, of the victory uh, of Hanukkah is for us to learn how to look at the natural. That's the point of it. The point of the miracle in the, in the temple of the oil burning for seven, uh, for seven days instead of one was to make us reflect on the war and see the war in, different per, in a different perspective. How does it do that? Well, the people who led the battle were the priests. Why were they galvanized to lead the battle? One of the reasons was because the Greeks performed abominations in the temple. So, the, the war was a religious war. It was to remove the oppressor, in particular to remove the oppressor from the temple, so that we would be able to um, be able to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu the way he wants to be served. So, on the very day that we conquered Jerusalem, the war kept going. We were, we were moving from south to north, and we had to continue to, get, to push the Greeks out. We had to continue. It went on for, I don't know how much longer, months anyway. Um, but we conquered Jerusalem, and we came to the temple, and we cleaned out the temple, 
And then it was a question of lighting a menorah. Well, the golden menorah wasn't available. You don't have to make the gold the menorah out of gold. You can make it out of wood. You can make it out of, out of metal. You can make it out of anything you want. So they made a makeshift menorah. Right? And then oil. They're looking and looking and looking for what? For oil that's tahor. Oil that's pure. Why? Why are they looking for pure oil? The law is that if the only oil you have is tummy, you use tummy oil. Being tahor is not ma'akiv. Doesn't, it's not a necessary condition for the oil. The people were dying, and uh, dead bodies communicate tumor, and there was nothing that could be, uh, have any reason to think wasn't contaminated. And was, so use the tummy oil. No, they're struggling and struggling to find a, 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 some oil that would be tahor. So when a Kodesh who does the miracle that they find that one cruise of oil with the signature of the Kohen Gadol, he makes the miracle so they can do the mitzvah in the best possible way. He doesn't do the miracle so they can do the mitzvah. They can do the mitzvah without it. He makes the miracle so they can do the mitzvah in the best possible way. All right, now let's think back. They made a war risked their lives to chase the Greeks out of the temple and out of their... Uh, is there a law in halacha that if a goy comes into the temple and does an abomination there, that you have to risk your life to stop it? No. There's no such law. There are only three types of, of, of uh, violations for which you're required to risk your life, and that's not one of them. They made a war when they weren't, strictly speaking, required to do it because they couldn't stand that kind of abomination. They made a war that's lifting Mishur Sadin, that's going beyond what's strictly required. So Kodesh Baruch Hu did a nace for them, enabling them to do the mitzvah in a way that's not strictly required. It goes beyond what's strictly required. It's Zelum said when you look at the war and you look at the miracle, they match one another. They have exactly the same structure. Now, you take the little amount of oil, and it lasts for seven days. That's a miracle. That's an open miracle. Now you take the few, and, you, and, and they conquer the many. You take the weak, and they conquer the strong. Although that does happen in other cases, like we said in Vietnam, and in the American Revolutionary War, and so forth and so on. What it's teaching you is that sometimes, that, that when it happens, it looks natural, but it isn't natural. What looks like nature also is divine providence. So just like in the oil, the divine providence is visible, that's to teach you that in the war, it was also divine providence, even though it wasn't visible. It's hidden divine providence. The whole exercise is an exercise in how to look at nature. I used to call this the nature of nature. In fact, the fact that nature isn't what it seems to be, Nature is itself divine activity in a way that the divine author of the activity is invisible. Now, the word nes in Hebrew, which is translated as miracle, has other meanings. In particular, a nes is like is, is a pole in which you hang a flag. Nes also refers to nisayon, which is a test, which is a test. Let's think. When you have a pole, you hang the flag on it. What does the flag do? The flag identifies something. I'm not talking about flags of beauty, but in a, you're looking for the post office, look for the building that has a flag in front. Don't do that in Detroit. Detroit, they're very patriotic, and you have flags flying everywhere. But in many cities, a, flag that's fly, a building that has a flag flying means it's a government building. If you're on the battlefield and you're fighting, and it's very confusing, and people are scattered over there, they're kicking up dust and everything else, and you need to get back to your army. How do you know where your army is? Which direction is my, ah, there's my flag. That flag is where my army is. That's right. The flag identifies what it's attached to. The flag identifies what it's attached to. The importance is not in the piece of cloth. The importance is the army, but oh, that's how I know where the army is. 
So a flag is something which identifies the character of something else it's attached to. Okay, what's a test? Well, if you are fortunate enough, unfortunate to be in school, fortunate, right? And your teachers test you. Why do they test you? Because your grade is going to be given on the basis of what you know, and they can't peek inside your skull to see how much you know. So they give you a test so as to have a symptom of how much you know. The test is a symptom of what's going on in your brain. It reveals what's going on in your brain. So the test does the same thing. The test reveals what's hidden in your brain. Same thing's true with, with all sorts of tests. I make earthen vessels. I advertise, mine are very strong. The skeptical customer from Brooklyn says, that's what everybody says. What do you mean yours are strong? Watch. Watch. I mean it. Pick up the vessel, I take a hammer, bang! And it rings like a bell and stands there. Wow, he says, I guess your, your, your vessels really are strong. The test revealed the strength of the vessel. Without that, you wouldn't see the strength of the vessel. So tests also reveal something about the thing that's tested. It's not the testing that's the valuable thing. It's the information the test gives you about the thing that's being tested. So a flagpole holds a flag that identifies what it's attached to. A test is something which gives you information about what's being tested. So what's a miracle? Well, one thing a miracle is, it is a flag or a test to reveal the character of something else. Don't get lost in the oil. I'm not saying that the miracle of the oil is irrelevant or that it's not important in and of itself, but don't get lost in the oil. Realize that the main lesson that the events are supposed to teach us is how to look at the war, to give thanks for the war, not to discount the war. Well, that's guerrilla warfare, you know. That's, that's the way in which you fight against foreign invaders and so forth and so on. Yeah, that was it was my strength, my, my efforts. That, that made it. But God did a miracle with the oil. No, that we missed the major point. The major point is to use the miracle of the oil as a stimulus to rethink what the war was and give praise for the war. And that's why it's missing from the prayers. Because you have to focus on the war and learn the lesson of what, what's, what so-called nature is. That's the lesson that we're supposed, that's supposed to learn. Now, and again, not that there aren't other meanings in the, in the oil. That's why here, even when you're going to light the menorah, the only thing mentioned is war. It's a very powerful, powerful uh, observation, first of all, and, and a very powerful explanation of the observation. And there's, there's a whole longer background of how miracles work and the fact that even from the very beginning, the miracles have doubled character to, uh, to teach this, this sort of lesson. But that's the way I would explain the, uh, <clears throat> the absence of, of um, mentioning of the, of the, um, of the uh, event, of the, of, of, the, of the oil, the absence of the oil, and the, and, the, and the overwhelming emphasis on the war. So that's the lesson that needs to be learned. Why didn't they really, why wasn't it necessary for them to start the war to go start the war? Why? Earlier with, with the, uh, or, or, or Kem did the miracle of the narrows to make it more, to make them more, more, uh, more, like in a more good way to do the mitzvah and then in a better way to, to do the mitzvah? Or? I don't know about that. The point, I mean, you know, there was... Matisio and his children, and then there was a whole, a whole revolutionary force, a whole guerrilla force that, that fought with him. I assume there were people on various different levels, and people who have their various different uh, depths of understanding, and then there were people who, for one reason or another, didn't fight, but they knew the war was going on, and they saw the results of the war. This lesson has to be taught for the whole people. Why didn't they have to go to war? Who? They did go to war. Well, I mean, why was it not necessary to go to war? Because the, you, there's no mitzvah in the Torah to resist a non-Jew who's doing something bad in the temple by, and risk your life. There's no such mitzvah because Rabbi didn't require us to do it. 
They would just continue to do abominations in the Torah, in the, in the, in the temple. Why did David, David Amalek spend his whole life here and doing that if, it, if he had no fear? Well, he wasn't, he wasn't take, stopping people from doing abominations in the temple. That didn't happen in his time. Right. I don't want you to what the connection with David Amalek. If he didn't have to go to war, why did he spend his I didn't say he didn't have to go to war. I said in this case, where the purpose was to stop the abominations of the temple. I didn't say there's no mitzvah to go to war. There are times when there's... Uh, but, that, but this particular purpose of stopping abominations of the temple is not enough. Uh, is, is not a, a requirement where you have to go to war and risk your life. It isn't. <clears throat> you can do it, but it's not, not required. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't understand uh, so much the, uh, the importance of uh, the, uh, um, the miracle of the oil. Uh, because uh, since the important thing is that they manage to uh, re uh, reoccupy the temple, and uh, if so, if in case they, they, the oil only lasts one day, like I guess a few days later, um, they will get uh, a pure oil and then uh, uh, light the menorah. Even more more than that, I said. In the meantime, they will light impure oil. Yeah, so th that's why I think maybe uh, like I have a thought for an alternative expl explanation why it's not here. Because the uh, the prayer focus on on the kind of important stuff that they re they manage to reoccupy the temple, so that's why we need to uh, kind of like set the focus the focus on the on the crucial thing the crucial miracle that happened or the crucial thing that that was achieved, and and another point uh, if I may yeah. uh, is that um, um, after after like even in the fallen of, of the second temple. Maybe there are other like small miracles, small victories, which are not necessarily uh, in um, in prayer. So yeah. that's that's why another kind of like thought that also supports uh, this this point that again the, the crucial uh, uh, the, the crucial thing was that uh, the Jews managed to to reoccupy uh, re the temple. So that's why it's uh, it's in here, and not the oil. If the miracle hadn't happened, the miracle of the oil hadn't happened, then what you say would be perfectly understandable. But the miracle of the oil did happen. So given that it did happen, you have to understand, and especially if the point of the oil is what you thought, that we, we, had, we got, have the temple back, and this is what the miracle did in the temple on the first moment when we got it back, that certainly should be celebrated. He made that miracle in the temple and getting the temple back and doing the mitzvahs in the temple is the thing that's important according to you. <clears throat> then that's a good reason for the oil to be in the prayers. No, according, according to what I understand is that the, the important uh, uh, part is the, the reoccupation of the temple. And that, that doesn't uh, mention here in the, uh, in the prayer. I mean, it does not mention it. It is mentioned. There okay. The to, to, beat, to, to, to beat the Greeks and take the temple back. Right, but I'm saying, what is the purpose of the, of the miracle of the oil, according to you? Um, to, to relight the, uh, the temple and... Uh, okay, and, and, of course, and of course, we did a miracle. We have, in all our literature, we celebrate miracles that took place. All the miracles took place in leaving Egypt, and all the miracles took place in the, in the wilderness. Of course, Rachel did a miracle. Why shouldn't you mention the miracle? Associated with being in the temple. Associated with doing the service of the temple. That's the important thing. Associated with that. And then just, but, but, but mention it. To ignore it altogether. The, 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 but the answer is that you're, you're looking at an important superficial level, and you're not looking at the, the, the important deep level. This was a conflict between the Greeks and the, and the Jews. It wasn't just that the Greeks had an army. They might just as well have been Nigerians or people from Alaska. You know, who knows? They came with an army and they subjugated us and they won. No, there was a philosophical conflict here. I told you the Greeks were philosophical and they appreciated the fact that we're philosophical. And there was a fundamental philosophical conflict here. For them, everything is nature. For us, nothing is nature. Because Rochu wanted to see the triumph of that idea. Not just we happened to outmaneuver them and kill more of them and therefore we won the war. That wasn't the, 
That, that wasn't the, the most fundamental uh, uh, thing to be accomplished. The thing to be accomplished was to show the Jewish people that the fundamental principle that we have, that we reject nature altogether, is the way in which we, uh, we got the temple back. That's, yeah. I mean, I see like the, the core issue that still has in the Shem Kuli, it's the, the not being required to do such war mm-hmm. and yet doing it and all the, 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 the potency of, of the miracles that happened through that war. As Rob just mentioned, that it, it's because it was like an entire ideological conflict. Yeah. But then, like, the, how to how to see in many, uh, let's say, through the centuries, when we weren't required, and like the like, it's very hard to, to see like what, <laughs> how is it that the not being required has been sometimes taken like as a like as a more more to that side than to like like what's the <laughs> How to know? How to know? Like the what they they decided to do it because it, they couldn't stand it. Well, I don't think it's, they couldn't stand it. These were the, this was the high priest and this yeah, was yeah. his people. Yeah, yeah. They had a very deep grasp of everything that was going on, and and they and they saw that uh, the, the, that 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 it was important to do. It was important and right to do. Not that it was a a legal mitzvah requiring it for them, for them to do it, but it was important and right to do. Um, but every circumstance is different, as I said. If, 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 if given what I just said in answer to him, that would answer your question also. Because teaching this principle that what looks like nature really is divine providence, that that's what got done. That was done that time. It was finished. It has to be done again. Right? That, so then the later conflicts don't have that that purpose. They have a, 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 the you know it's, it's a different uh, different type of. Uh, Different type of, of of conflict. Each generation and each circumstance uh, and each population has its own its own uh, its own tests. Yeah. So um, the the Anshek uh, Mister Gora wrote uh, wrote also. Uh, uh, it's very difficult to know. They set up the structure of of tefillah three times a day and the basic structure of the Shema Esrei, but there are Gemaras which indicate that the text was fluid. To, for a long time, and exactly who who wrote each words, I don't know. I don't know if we. I don't know if we if we know. There was one time when someone got up to say the repetition of the prayer, and he added a whole long passage, and he was only criticized for uh, the fact that he used material that was inappropriate. It didn't say it's not in our text. You know what are you doing adding to the text? He wasn't criticized for that. So it's very difficult to know. Who exactly decided upon which pieces of, of actual text? <coughs> I, I, maybe maybe art schools. Is, I, don't, I don't know who they attribute this to. Who, who wrote it? Let's just take a look. Maybe they say something here. Also, I know that some synagogue adds a, a prayer for uh, the sake of the state of Israel. So I guess I guess um, my, my, I'm, if I come from a point. I'm just asking: Isn't it a problem that we don't know, like what? That we know don't know who wrote it, and so how come it's not a problem? That uh, like, and who allows to 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 add lines to our prayer? That's a, that's a general question, but you know, the fact that it's in the prayer means that the people who knew where it came from decided that it was appropriate to be there. So the fact that we don't know doesn't, doesn't create any problem. We know how these prayers got, got established. They got established for the, for, for the religious Jewish world by people whom the religious Jewish world accepted as their leaders. So wh- whatever generation it was, uh, let me just see if he says anything here. It was uncertain. No. I don't say anything about it. I, I don't know. I, I, I just know that the, the, the text was, fair, was fairly fluid. Now, having said that, the differences that we have between Ashkenaz and Sfarat and you know, the Mizrach and everything else, the differences are 3%. All the, uh, so the, the 3% of the text is very, very, uh, almost completely identical. So that being the case, it's got to be something which was you know, accepted at a time when it would be the basis for all the different groups that we have. 
Otherwise, we'd have vastly different prayers. We don't, and we don't have vastly different prayers. I wanted to say one more thing to answer what you said before. I think you you picked on a very, very important um, general issue: the idea of the fact that in some generations, God is more hidden and sometimes less hidden. Um, the amount of hiddenness determines the kinds of tests that you face. Uh, today, there are Jews who struggle with the problem of atheism. If you were in the wilderness with, with Moses, a- atheism was not on the page. <laughs> if you take an atheist position, they would throw you out as a mental incompetent. Right? You're seeing miracles all the time. Korach re- uh, criticized Moses' judgment in a particular case and was swallowed up by the earth. There's no question that atheism is not, not so it wasn't, a, it wasn't a problem for them. For us, it is a problem. So you have different periods of time, different amounts of different types of divine re- revelation, divine hiddenness, that set up the circumstances under which they had to face their battles. And what you have to know is that, I mean, it's obvious that uh, there are different battles to be faced at different times. The Rogo has a whole, a whole comprehensive plan for the way in which the efforts of people in different times will meld together into a, into a, a uh, complete integrated creation of the perfection of the world. So um, it's, a, it's, a very, um, it's a very important issue, the amount of and the type of hiddenness that there is. And I will make one more remark. We must be very careful against anachronism. You know, If I saw a pillar of fire, it would be all over. Yeah, that's because you're you. But if you saw a pillar of fire in the ancient world, that wouldn't, make, that wouldn't uh, be all over. You know, take the plagues in Egypt. Why didn't the Egyptians all become Jews? The Nile turned to blood. That's impressive. How many times did it happen? Only once? Why? Why only once? Maybe a god got tired. Maybe he snuck up on the Nile when the Nile wasn't looking. But now the Nile's looking and he doesn't dare challenge the Nile again because there are many gods. There were three weeks of nothing in between, right? The, the Egyptian will say, the sun is shining. Even when your god is quiet, the sun is shining. I worship the sun. Where's your God in the three weeks off? Resting up? That's the way they looked at the world. So what we call a miracle, and we would be overwhelmed and expect everybody to, be, uh, to, to agree, they said, well, you know, we have miracles also. The Nile River overflows and gives us pr- productivity, and no place else do you have it, and we are the breadbasket of the whole, uh, whole Near East. You show me that in Syria. Show me that in your land of Israel. You don't have a Nile River there, do you? You depend on rain. You do have rain, you don't have rain, you pray for rain. I have denial here. That's my God. Show me your God as it's good as that. That was their attitude. So the, the fact that we had miracles didn't mean that we automatically won the argument against everyone. They had miracles also. Lightning was for the, for the, for the Roman Romans. Jupiter throws the lightning bolts. Right? Does your God throw lightning bolts? Didn't see it in your literature. He says it, you know, no. so, no. That's uh, the, the, there what we would regard as revealing himself wasn't such a big revelation because other people could, could explain it away and other people could claim that they have things going on for them as well. When the Babylonians conquered us, they, one of the things they said is, you see now that our God is stronger than your God because we conquered you. So... How would they answer our like, theology? Our what? How would they answer our theology? How would they react to our theology? I mean, our theology oh, our theology to them was nuts. Fundamentally rejects everything. It's nuts. First of all, you have an invisible God? Uh-huh. That's just because you don't have a God and you're making it up, right? <laughs> Look at the sun. There's my God. Where's your God? Invisible? You're just joking. That was one complaint that they had. And as I have said on previous occasions, intuitively, polytheism is much more natural than monotheism. The world doesn't look unified that way. The things that go on in the world are such different character. They re- behave in such different ways. The idea that there's only one agent, and that one agent expresses himself in all these different ways is a very extravagant idea. Indeed, some people want to say that the move for unification in science came from monotheism. It certainly came in monotheistic lands. You know, the Chinese didn't do it. The Indians didn't do it. Uh, if you have a belief in one creator, as in spite of the fact that there's so much disparity in the world, 
So then he could think, if there's one creator, maybe there's one plan, maybe there's one principle, and you could search for it. But otherwise, the idea of, of, a, of a single creator, a single manager of the world, just certainly doesn't look that way. So um, it, it, the position that we took was the Greeks made fun of us uh, for that reason. Because they said, you know, you're just joking when they, in terms of the theology. Okay. Yeah. Over to you.